Welcome. Today we begin our discussion on hesychism, an idea found within Eastern Orthodox mysticism, a form of Christian ascetical mysticism. This is actually our only two-part discussion while we're going through these different theistic or even before the atheistic systems of beliefs and practices. Today we are going to turn our attention to Gregory of Palamas. So what do you think of when you hear ascetical mysticism? Most of you are probably thinking of mysticism and usually think more about the East than the West. This is a common default for a lot of Western minds is the mystical is the other. And therefore you're probably thinking of places like India. Uh, and since we're talking about asceticism, you're probably talking, thinking about starving yogis uh, and the discussion that exists there or because we are talking about Christianity beginning you might be thinking back to earlier ascetics uh, and those stylite monks who lived up on the pillars things might be a little bit different if I ask you the question of what do you think of when you hear hesychism most of you probably approach the class going I've got no clue uh, of what this term is. It's a foreign word. Uh, it's Greek. I don't really understand it. Maybe some of you are trying to parse the word and are thinking chasm is this have something to do with some sort of hole of some sort, some giant gap between us and something else. And if that's what you're thinking, I applaud you for, for trying. It's not right, but hey, you're there. Now, what if I add another word instead and go with an English notion, that of quietism? Most of you might be thinking of someone telling you to be quiet. That just basic act of telling you, shh, right? Thinking of a librarian or, or something to that effect. Now, all of these terms, ascetical, mystic, hesychism, and quietism, all have kind of the same meaning here in what we're trying to talk about. We're looking at a particular application which is known as hesychism specifically, but has notions of ascetical mysticism and notions of quietism uh, being in there. But when we mean quietism, we're not meaning somebody to tell you to just be quiet, but it's quieting yourself. It's being still in yourself. Think of Psalm 46.10 here in that discussion, right? Of be still and know that I am God. Since hesychism is a term that's unfamiliar to most of you, a brief history would be appropriate. The term hesychist, a person, was used to designate a hermit really from the very beginning of monastic history. We're looking at second century. This becomes a term that's used a little bit, uh, growing obviously in popularity as time goes by, especially for monastics in the East. Key to the notion of hesychism is a particular mode or practice of prayer. According to Evangelius Ponticus, a fourth century monk, Prayer is the highest activity of the mind, the activity appropriate to the dignity of the mind, an ascent of the mind to God. The state of prayer, he wrote, can be aptly described as a habitual state of imperturbable calm. Easier to write than it is to say that one. He says it matches to the heights of intelligible reality, the mind which loves wisdom and which is truly spiritualized by this most intense love. So it's the mind's activity towards God, but it creates calmness and love. We will see a connection here with 13th century philosopher St. Bonaventure, as many as a host of other philosophers, that if you prayer is an ascent of the individual to God, Similarly, one ascends through the senses by moving from the outer world to the inner world. For Bonaventure, we have that same sort of idea here of looking within to rise up to be with God. We have the idea that the love of God and a constant state of prayer will help the individual to overcome the passions because the passions are there to interfere with this constant state of prayer. 
No, it's being called on. It's not just praying and just constantly babbling or anything to that effect, but rather more a mode of prayer, a mode of engagement. In the 5th and 6th centuries, a greater emphasis is placed on what's called the prayer of the heart, specifically through utilizing what's known as the Jesus prayer. And we'll see this expanded on a lot more with the life and the work of St. John Climacus uh, next time. It's a simple but difficult discipline of trying to keep your mind in your heart. But what does that mean? Most of us look at the mind and the heart as sometimes competing interests, that maybe there's a friendly antagonism between the two. The heart's wanting to go one way or the, the mind another, or we want to say that one is just emotionalism and one is rationalism. And yet this isn't entirely what it means. When we think of your heart, we're thinking of feelings, but really for this purpose, what we're trying to address is love, not just you know, I feel good, I feel bad, and, and letting your emotions dictate, but actually having love dominate what you do. But not just any love, there's types of love. Remember, we addressed this before, right? We have agape, filio, and eros. Eros, I love because I get, filio, reciprocal, and agape, I love despite the fact that I'm only giving. And really, when we're trying to keep the mind and the heart, what we're trying to do is have a rational love. It's a reasoned thought, a reasoned response. It's not just craziness. It's not irrational. It's not, ooh, ooh gimme, gimme. There's a reciprocal relationship, or even one that grows to care for others, regardless of what you get, in part because of other objects of your love, namely that of God. So this is the practice, this is the difficulty of trying to keep your mind in your heart. The Hesychus answer this discussion by what they say is placing the name of Jesus in their heart. Since the name of God is identified with the presence of the divine person itself, Therefore, attaching the name of Jesus to your breath becomes the discussion that Climacus and others point out. This is an intentional and rational attempt to try to conform your physiology to your psychology and vice versa. This connecting your physiology and your psychology is actually really advanced for the fifth and sixth centuries. This is really a science that's getting discovered more and more just recently. There's many different therapies that exist to try to create uh, using your mind to overcome your body or your body to overcome your mind. That if you smile, there's different endorphins that exist in your brain that tells you you need to be happy. So it starts releasing chemicals in your brain to make you happy because you physically made yourself smile. There's a reason why habits feed addictions and mental states and and it's this connection between your body and your mind. So if you attach physical acts with mental acts, if you attach words and ideas to physical expressions, your attitudes and perceptives change. Sometimes it's got a positive reaction. Sometimes it's got a negative one. If any of you have had an experience where you injured yourself doing something mundane and ordinary, every time you approach that mundane and ordinary thing again, your brain gets in the way and you start to freak out a little bit. Even though you only injured yourself that one time, it was serious enough that your body is, you know, reacting to it. Food poisoning, right? You had that irrational, semi-rational attachment of that food to being sick. Now I can't eat that food anymore. I had a bad case of food poisoning where I just got sick after I ate it and it had nothing to do with the food at all. And I know this food is particularly good, but eh, I just feel queasy and uneasy because it happened at that time. 
Sometimes there's forms of alcohol poisoning that is the same thing. You drink too much of one thing and now you avoid that. Your brain says that that's a no-go zone. And many other events happen the other way around as well. Your mind can convince certain problems and you have different habits of overcoming that with physical tendencies that help rewire your brain in a positive way. And this is really what the prayer of the heart is. It's this connection between your mind and your body. It's using words and objects to rewire the way you approach the world. The main way, the main instrument in doing this is known as the Jesus prayer. It's to meditate upon the name of Jesus, often in a very simple prayer. Repetition of the phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, over and over and over again. Now, very quickly, we can look at this short prayer and ask, what would it do? Obviously, you're going to be a Christian. You're identifying Christ as the Lord, the Son of God, right? So there's that statement of faith, as it were, at the very beginning. And if you don't hold that, then that's going to change your approach. But what's the next part? Have mercy on me, a sinner. Other versions might have the term the, different article there, the sinner. But the focus becomes on have mercy on me. That you are the object that needs mercy. What's that going to do to a lot of the other problems and you have with other people in your life? Well, they're horrible. They're a jerk. They're evil. They're in my way. It's really hard to have that attitude if you're asking constantly, have mercy on me. That you're the object who needs mercy. That you're the sinner but a sinner in relationship with this Lord, that you're the one who needs mercy. It's not a rejection of others, but it allows for a rational love for those others. Because of course I will forgive them and love them. I need forgiveness and love myself. And this prayer is intentionally brief. It's short. Why? So you can attach it to your breath. So it can always be in the background, a constant state of prayer that's being said, sometimes experientially, without saying the words over and over again, but saying them with your breathing, that you're attaching this idea to that. It becomes a second nature and that you'll internalize this message as a result of that. Oftentimes, it's done with physical objects as well. A prayer rope is the standard tool. Later, you'll see Catholic forms of this. The development of the rosary emerges out of this. Um, but this is the basic prayer rope that you're going to find within Eastern Orthodox Christianity. This is a practice that started with the beginning of monasticism with St. Anthony the Great, a third century monk who tied ropes with special knots that each had seven crosses on each one. And usually the ropes would have 33 knots and a marker. And then sometimes continue the pattern and grow even more, some of which will have a total of 100 or 200 or even sometimes more than that uh, knots long. And you're just going to constantly be moving through, saying the prayer, moving the knot, moving on the next one, saying the prayer over and over and over again while also engaged in other parts of life. And while this is a tool primarily used for monks, it's also something that's used by the laity as well. Sometimes in services, sometimes not, sometimes out in life, you've got a bracelet or the rope or, or whatever, and you're moving through and doing that. It becomes a part of trying to make prayer natural. You're attaching your breath, your breathing, you're slowing down life to go through and pray. It's a physical connection to a psychological act. This will also be expanded on later on with popular devotional works, 
especially those written in Russia that expand on this idea. Probably the most popular of the work is, is The Way of the Pilgrim. So this brings us to another question, is this natural? Is it natural to pray? Why is it natural to pray for those of you who say that it is, or, or why not for those of you who say it's not? If it's natural, then why don't you do it as often as you eat and drink and sleep and anything else? Why doesn't everyone do it? Is it more natural for some, like a monk, to pray than it is for a steel worker or a student? Can it really be as natural as breathing, as is advocated by some? That this is the starting point of everything. The Hesychists argue that the fullness of human life is something that can be attained only when man does what is essential to human nature, namely entering into this relationship with God. And we should notice very easily that the aim is not any different than the cynics and the others. It's to do what's natural. The discussion becomes over what's natural. That this becomes the question. What is natural for man? Palamas, who we'll get to momentarily, argues that the passions are these deceitful desires that move us away from our nature. And that the reason why you might think it's not natural to pray is because of your attachment to the passions, to your desires that draw you away. Just as you might have desires to do things that conflict with other things that are natural. We would all say that it's natural to sleep, but how often do you stay up a little later watching a show or reading a book or talking to somebody and pushing away what's natural or have alarm clocks wake you up so you can make it to work or school or, or something else that's breaking what's natural it's completely natural to sleep but you change and modify that it's completely natural to eat but there's times that you eat, there's times that you don't eat. There's certain things that you eat too much of, and there's periods of time when you don't eat much of anything. Maybe you're dieting, fasting, traveling, something. Well, it's a natural act. You're artificially constraining it. Now, what if it's something that's natural that you can constrain away in large measure to where you hardly do it? but it's always there becomes part of that idea. It's always there for anybody to reach back on. Even if you're an ardent atheist who hates the idea of God and, and thinks the whole thing is foolish, the Hesychus would say, but prayer is still right there. You can do it at any moment. Borrowing from the Psalms, uh, Marcius moves the center of the human consciousness and of the divine presence in man from the mind to the heart. Prayer is an activity of the heart and the mind, but the center of activity isn't just what you're rationally thinking, but it's what you experience and how you relate to those experiences. In many ways, it wasn't fair for me to ask you if prayer was natural. You're a product of your culture and your history, and there's a long history that looks at these discussions differently, especially following 1054, where we have a split between Eastern and Western halves of Christianity. Eastern, generally go with the title of Orthodox, well, Western Catholic, and Protestants are a product of the West, of, of an outgrowth of Catholicism and the theology of that half of the empire, that half of understanding where Christianity is going to see what's natural. And in the West, there became a larger emphasis on original sin, on that partaking of the forbidden fruit. And it follows the theology of St. Augustine, who 
advocated that man is born in a natural state of sin and that sin is what we love even more than we love God. We can see this in his work, the Confessions, in his discussion of the pear tree, he even addresses this in notions of infancy. This is then expanded on by people like St. Anselm of Canterbury, who says that the natural act becomes one of rebellion against God. And it's only through the sacraments and through the church that this rebellion can end and look different. In the East, this isn't the central emphasis. Rather, there was a greater look at the theology of the people known as the Cappadocian Fathers, who argue that we live in a fallen world, but our natures are not at enmity with God. So while both are Christian and both would actually agree to some measure that the fall had a greater impact. Is it original sin that we're all born with and at enmity with God? Or is it that we're in a fallen world that's got the consequences of that fallenness? Sin, death being part of those. But in many ways, it's what's going to be emphasized and then what's going to be emphasized even later as a result of that. In Eastern Christianity, there's no real doctrine of original sin. Rather, it's ancestral sin. It's the idea that we live in a sinful and fallen world. We're not by default at enmity of, with God. It doesn't mean we're good, but what is found in our human nature is notions of prayer and a longing for connectedness with God. That prayer is completely natural for the Eastern half. If I was to ask the same question in Greece or Russia or anywhere that's orthodox, the answer would have been a little bit more towards, yeah, prayer is natural. Maybe I don't do it as often as I should, this, that, and the other. But it's not seen as something that's as hard as it would be for Western theology following Augustine and Anselm, where your general approach is different. In fact, for Eastern Orthodox, it's in prayer that man becomes truly himself and you reestablish this right and natural relationship with God. So without this idea of original sin, we're able to look at things a lot differently. To best understand Hesychism, we need to look at the major confrontation that takes place in the early 14th century. The chief opponent of Hesychism is a man by the name of Barlaam of Calabria. And Barlaam criticized the notions of Hesychism because he didn't like the idea that any rational concepts could be expressed about prayer and the divine human relationship. This grew out of his reading of Dionysius and Dionysius's apophatic or negative theology that said that God is so great that our words are incomplete when communicated and therefore we have to use negative terms like infinite or eternal outside of time etc when describing god we see the same sort of use of negative theology or apophatic theology with the works of maimonides but barlaam takes this a step farther uh, much more than dionysius would ever have felt comfortable with and advanced this sort of theological agnosticism that denied even the use of metaphors. Dionysius loved the use of symbolic theology. He has this long discussion about Psalm 78. And this really countered really the traditional stance of the church that the theologian was one who prays. Barnalam asks, how can an intimate communion of man with the divine be achievable through prayer since the divine is transcendent and dwelling in inapproachable light as it says in first timothy therefore he advocates that no one can apprehend the essential being of god this erupted into a major discussion in the 1330s and again grew out of this apophatic theology barlam will end up composing a satirical work where he defames hesychism and demeans the adherences, calling them omphilosikoi, or men whose souls are in their navel.
right? This is the origin of our modern term for navel gazers, right? This is Barlaam's word, and a term that you probably have used your before and might not even know where it came from, but it grows out of this criticism and out of the posture of Esychus in acts of prayer. Ultimately, by the way, Barlaam will lose and he will leave Constantinople and he'll go back to Italy uh, where he becomes a central figure in the development of humanism, a movement that will dominate the 14th century in Italy. He is the teacher to both Robert the Wise, the king of Naples, and more importantly, Petrarch, who often identified as the father of humanism through his poetry. The great champion of Hesychism is St. Gregory of Palamas. We actually know quite a bit about his early life. His father was very pious, but was also a member of the imperial court. He died while Gregory was young, and Gregory was in many ways destined to rise up and be in that imperial court. But sometime around the age of 20 or 22, either 1316 or 1318, Gregory decided instead to join a monastery on Mount Athos. This happens to be the central monastic land for Orthodox Christians. It's an island, uh, and there's many different monasteries all over it. He also, by the way, convinced his mother, two sisters, and at least two brothers to join different monasteries at the same time. So far more devout than he was interested in material gains of this world. While he's there, he's going to study from major monastic teachers at, at the time, and eventually arrive at the Lavra of St. Athanasius, where he's going to learn this method of unceasing prayer and mental activity, hesychism, that we've been talking about. Although in 1326, he's forced to flee Mount Athos as the Turks are threatening to invade the Holy Mountain, and he relocates himself in Thessalonica, where he's going to become the priest and eventually will be named the bishop of this major city in Greece. Throughout the 1330s, he's engaged in theological writings and most came out of this disagreement that's going to take place between him and Barlaam. He will die November 14th, 1359, and was canonized a saint in 1368. The confrontation between Barlaam and Palamas came down to a simple question of what can be known? What can you know about the unknown? What can you know about God? And can prayer actually create an intimate communion with this unknowable God? By the way, to, to cut to the quick, the council was convened in Constantinople later to address this question, and Gregory will be deemed the winner and correct, but the basic question is probably one that you've encountered before in your life or can is, how can we know what is unknowable? Just to start off with some preliminary questions, if you haven't really thought about this before, are any of you omniscient? Do you know everything there is to know right now? Do you know everything that you're ever going to know right now? Another question on that same end. If you answered no to either of those propositions, then you've admitted that you learn, or at least that you're capable of learning. So how do you learn? How is it that you approach what you don't know and gain knowledge of that? What is this process like? Let, let's move into a different realm. Instead of talking about knowing the unknowable God, how do you learn math? What do you do? How did you learn that 2 plus 2 is 4, assuming you already had that bit of knowledge? You're going to also probably disagree with Socrates, who says that it's notions of recollection, that you don't actually learn. And you can say, no, I do learn. So how do you learn this basic math? 
let alone advanced math or anything else. Generally speaking, you would say that you ask the expert. You're going to find somebody who knows about that, who owns that knowledge and gives it to you. And of course, it's always best to ask the source of that knowledge itself. Abstract concepts like math don't have a source, they're universally shared. But a lot of things you would ask somebody directly. I don't know, I'm gonna ask you. So big, tough, monumental question for you. What color are your socks? I know that seems weird, seems odd. You're gonna look down on your feet probably because you don't recall what it is. You say, oh, my socks are this color. Now, you said it, or at least you're thinking it. If you were to tell somebody, what color are your socks? What did you lose when that information is shared? Do you lose that information? Do you lose that knowledge? When it's given away, when it's shared? No, you don't. See, sharing knowledge is, is a different sort of thing than sharing other things. If I share my money with you, I don't have that money. You've got it. I've given it away to you. No, maybe we'll return it. Maybe there's an exchange or, or something else, but right, I don't have that anymore if I'm sharing it with you. If I share a loaf of bread, you have half of it, and I have half of it. I don't have that whole loaf anymore. It, there's a division that takes place. But with knowledge, that's not the case. Knowledge is always multiplied. It doesn't cost the giver of the knowledge anything to share that knowledge with those who don't know. When you share something, you know you don't lose your essence in this argument. You transfer something else with somebody else. Right? You don't change when you share knowledge of yourself either. You're not lesser than, but yet you've put out there to that object who's learning something about you. Even though you internally might not be known, you can still relate these ideas to others. So can the same be true of God? Can God share information about God or not? Barlaam says no. God is completely unknowable. You can't do all of this. But Gregory argued that Barlaam is partially correct. That indeed God is unapproachable in God's essence. That you can't truly know God as God knows God. But... God can reveal himself through his energies, which are directed towards the world and are able to be perceived, even though they're not material nor created. Palamas really liked this in connection with the light of Tabor, the transfiguration, that culminating moment before Holy Week within the Synoptic Gospels where Christ revealed his glory in as much as his disciples could bear it. A light which enlightened his disciples, brought them closer to knowledge of who he was, but didn't detract in who God was, in God's essence in any way, and wasn't even a vision of the entire holiness of God. Nothing got lost except for information got shared. And while it might not be complete information, it is something gained and related to the apostles. Back to that whole issue with your socks, right? I may learn what your socks are like. I can ask you the color, the material, the cut, the size, and, and everything else that gets a little, a little bit much. But I'm not really ever going to know what it's like for you to have them on. 
even if I know everything about the socks and your sensations, right? Even if I know the size of your foot and the size of the sock, because there's a range in how well that fits in the material and what that material might even feel like for me. I don't know what it's like to, to walk a mile in your shoes. I won't know what that experience is like. I won't know you in your essence and how you relate to those objects on your feet. Just like you wouldn't know mine. We're able to share some information, those experiences of things, but we don't ever really know each other in your very essence. Some people you have a much more complete picture of because we share certain things in commonality. But even brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and etc. etc. right? Well, even though you might spend your life together, you still don't know what it's like to be them. But things can be learned and known that you can learn from one another. And Paul Moss says that this is the case, that we can learn the unknowable. We can't know the unknowable, but we can learn things that come from it. We can know God's energies, but not God's essence. In his major work, Defending Hesychism, the Triads, Palamas begins with asking a question of what should the relationship be between faith and reason? Is one subservient to the other? What is the value of earthly reason? Yet this is the starting point. What can we say about what we can know? What we actually already assume that we know? And what is the value of reason and education overall? He states that education not only dispels all other evils from the soul, since every passion has its root and foundation in ignorance, but it also leads men to the knowledge of God, for God is knowable only through the mediation of his creatures. We are able to learn, and that's going to help us get rid of passion. And notice here the similarity between Stoics and Socrates and Aristotle and Siddhartha Gautama, that ignorance creates error and passions have their root in ignorance. The passions which overwhelm the soul and drive us to sin comes from ignorance. As such, good education should dispel the power of the passions and it should be beneficial. So does philosophical wisdom help you overcome your passions? Can you learn and study and overcome the obstacles in your life? As Paul Moss and the Stoics and Socrates and Aristotle and Siddhartha Gautama claim, the answer is they can. It can help a lot, but not necessarily. What are you studying? What are you learning? What are you directing your energies to? You can gain certain things from that, but maybe not everything. He maintains that study of the external world will lead us to the studies for the reasons of that world, namely that of God. And here study is more than understanding a natural phenomena, but their inner principles, the logoi, as they exist in the mind of God. But we all know that not all wisdom is the same. Philosophy, he says, is a natural wisdom and a gift of God. But if it's abused or used against God or treated as greater than revelation, then it'll bring condemnation and not a, be a benefit to you, right? Once again, philosophy is a tool, like all realms of reason. It can be useful, but it can also bring death and ruin. It's something that can help you, but it can be misused. It can be treated as the great good all on its own and not as something in service to a greater thing. One should think of it once again, like fire, right? Fire when used properly can heat a home and cook food, can make life better for its presence, but 
It can also bring ruin and destruction if used improperly. If you treat a wrench like a hammer, you're going to ruin your wrench. And you're probably not going to fasten whatever nail you were hoping to with it either. It's going to be dented, it's going to be warped, it's not going to go in straight, etc. Right? Tools are great, but you have to have the right tool for the right job. And you need to know when to stop and when to start. Same thing is true with wisdom. Not all wisdom is the same. And you shouldn't treat all wisdom as the same thing. So what does he say about hesychism specifically, this form of knowledge, this placing the head in one's heart? It says, my brother, do you not hear the words of the apostle that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in us? But he's trying to show you very quickly at the very beginning that your body is an instrument of your soul, that it has got value in its own. And as such, we should worship God with our body and not just with our mind. That there's a union between these two. As for us, we think the mind becomes evil through the dwelling of fleshly thoughts. But there's nothing bad in the body since the body is not evil in itself. And Palamas is rejecting this idea that the body is somehow depraved and, and against God. We also see how the body can be in service to the soul with little things like posture and breathing and physical acts of prayer, like prostrations and use of ropes. You can easily notice these two hesychists on the screen, their, their posture, their, their focus. Well, I might just look that they're sleeping or, or dazing or, or something like this, that there's a, a value in what they're positionally doing. They're looking and focusing on something and they're using their body in conjunction with their mind, with their spirit. In another work, Palamas addresses the relationship between the passions and the virtues. And he starts by asking you questions like, what do you cultivate in your life? What is it that your life is doing? What is it you do in your body and with your mind? Do you sow virtues or the passions? Are you actively doing things to make your life better or are you just letting things kind of go by one moment to the next? Which is going to leave the fields for any sorts of weeds that may tumble in there. He states, whatever attitudes you instill it in, you will receive the same back. If you keep company with good people, listen to spiritual teaching and follow it, putting its precepts into practice, your soul cultivates virtues and becomes useful to God, to others, and to yourself. But if you delight in bad company and do not heed spiritual teaching or even regard it as trivial, your soul turns wild and out of control, sprouts evil passions, and yields the stings and thorns of its own, and the body's death namely sins. So are you trying to cultivate good things, godly things for Palamas? Whereas love of God is the source and starting point of every virtue, love for the world becomes the cause of all evil. For that reason, these two loves are at enmity with each other and destroy each other. Do you love your virtues? Do you love a virtuous life? Do you cultivate them or do you neglect them for bad habits instead? Once again, we should probably see a connection with Aristotle in this argument that habits help to form the virtues and that to become virtuous, you need to return and have good habits. So, we want to be virtuous. What habits should we cultivate? He addresses different methods or different means of doing this throughout this section. He says, indeed, we are to find a fixed point to focus on during prayer and meditation. Since we are looking inward in our meditation, this is the point often in the heart that we're trying to look at. 
first thing we need to do is we need to focus in on our heart. And you'll do this physically, not just mentally. Look and really focus. Have a fixed point that begins your meditation. Now, likely to do to physiological restraints, you're not able to look at your heart. It's a little uncomfortable or your neck's not long enough or anything else. So what do you do? You look at the next closest point, the next point that would make sense, and that's your navel, your stomach. Why? The stomach is a place that controls your animal nature, as believed from the Greek tradition forward, right? And focus our meditation there to purify it, and therefore by purifying yourself. Pay attention, says Moses, right? This is the next thing we need to do. Place, therefore, this guard, your mind being attentive over the soul and body. It will easily deliver you from the evil passions of the body and the soul. Maintain this watch, this attention, this self-control, or rather mount guard and be vigilant. Keep watch. For it is thus that you will make this disobedient flesh subject to the spirit, and there will no longer be a hidden word in your heart. So we need to have a point where we're focusing, where we're looking forward, and we need to be vigilant. We need to keep our mind on this. So you need to focus on your weaknesses. And what is your weakness? Where's the area where you fall short? You know it, and it's not the same as everybody else. You might struggle with something that another person looks at with ease. Same way you might have something that's a strength, right? Where you're like, hey, that's easy for me. I don't need to worry about that. But this thing over here, sheesh. So while you try to be vigilant about something, how do you really know what your strengths and weaknesses are? There's times when you might think that you've got a weakness in an area or a strength in an area until you see somebody else and you're like, okay, maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was in this way. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was in that way. That doesn't mean that you don't use your own judgment, but what do you do? What do you really do to know where your weaknesses are? You need to have a comparison. You need somebody who's going to be there to show you how you are while you walk the path of life. As Hume addressed the differences between the horses while he was addressing the passions, right? That you don't know if this is a Flemish horse or a Welsh horse until they're placed next to each other. And then the size becomes manifest. Same with different types of bottles of wine. Like some of those are really huge, but they look the same relatively from the outside. Maybe the label seems a little smaller as this, the bottle gets larger, but they're all roughly the same, right? You need to have another one to compare it to, to know what things are helping you and hurting you. Don't you use other people to let you know that you're doing well with something? Isn't that part of the reason why you are engaged in activities of learning with others instead of just on your own? To pay attention to yourself, you need to listen to what other people say. You need to tell others what you need help with as well. But this is not an individual activity. There's a concept within orthodoxy that says you're saved together and damned alone. But that your salvation is ultimately something that you're working on with other people. Other people are put in your life to aid you in this and you're put there to aid others that you're helping to carry their burdens if you're left trying to do this on your own that's when damnation sets in so this is a different sort of model than some of you might be familiar with you need to use other people to get what you need clarity of mind, overcoming the passions, etc. This, of course, brings us to another point. Have you ever intentionally told someone your faults, your mistakes, your sins, whichever term you're more comfortable with, walked up to somebody and said, 
All right, let me tell you this. Here's the things that I'm struggling with in my life. Here's the areas where I'm screwing up. Probably half of you or so have. Generally, what's your feeling going into this? Probably like you're getting called into that principal's office, right? Where you're like, oh no, this is gonna be horrible. This is just the worst thing ever. I've got to share my faults with another person. That means I've got to let go of some of that. I've got to give that to somebody else. But how do you feel afterwards? Usually you feel excited or happy. Like a giant burden was taken off of your shoulders. You realize there's great value in sharing even your faults with other people. In fact, some ways sharing those is more relieving than sharing your successes. Now you need to celebrate with other people too. That's not what we're saying, but you need to share where you need help. It's not necessarily because they give great advice. Sometimes their advice is of little use to you. But the process illustrates your dependence upon others and purifying yourself and making your life better. This can be done formally in any variety of settings, including sitting down with a psychiatrist, informally with a friend, or sacramentally through confession. This would be the option that Gregory would advise. This is the purpose for the sacrament of confession. That's why we even have phrases that confession is good for the soul. Sharing this is good because it helps you, not from any practical thing that comes out of it, but it unburdens you and helps you admit your faults and work on overcoming those. So we need to focus. We need to turn our attentions towards things and we need to Keep our eyes. We need other people for this process. Continuing on, Palamas says, when we return to the interior reflection, when we stop and we look at our own lives again, right? We're investigating ourselves as we're called to do. It's necessary to calm the sensations aroused by the external activities. We need to stop our engagement in the rest of life. But why should one calm those provoked by the dispositions of the soul of the good dispositions? Why is it that while you're trying to shut out the craziness of all the rest of the world, that you need to even shut out some of the good that you're getting out of this world? Palmas tells us that the first step to control the passions is to bring everything into check. While some parts of the body or the mind might be fine, if one part is out of control, the first thing we need to do is rest everything. And you know this intuitively because of other things that happen in your life. That if there's a problem, you need to stop and address that problem. How many of you have ever driven your car and you realize that the you got a flat tire or your brakes don't work? You know that if you continue to drive, there's going to be massive problems. Depending on which one, you could get into an accident, you could ruin your rims, there could be extra damage, and it could be far worse if you just kept proceeding. None of you say, well, my engine's running fine. My radio's optimal. I hear everything just fine. You know, say the, the oil pressure is okay, or the AC is working, or anything else. You say, no, there's a serious problem here. I need to stop the car. You slow down, you pull over, and you change the tire, you fix the brakes, you call for help for somebody to help you along those ways if need be. Palamas points out that this is why we do things like fast during Lent and other times of the year. It's not because we necessarily in overly indulge ourselves with food. In fact, this might be one of the easiest things to give up is the foods that are you crave during Lent or anything else, rich meats and, and everything else. But why is it you give those up? 
Because if you can control one aspect, you can learn how to control the others as well. That by pausing ordinary life, by having periods of time throughout the year where you arrest everything, you, you, you pull the car over, you give it a once over and make sure that, yeah, you kick the tires and you test the brakes and you make sure everything is working. You're going to do this regularly to make sure that your life goes the way you want it to. So while you're pulled over on the side of the road, while you're pausing your life so you can get everything fixed, what's the aim? What's the goal? For Palamas, it's true prayer. It's doing what's natural. It's real connection with the divine, what you're created to do, according to Palamas. It's overcoming all of the problems in your life. He says true prayer requires the subjugation of all of the passions. Otherwise, the passions will prevent you from pure prayer by distancing you and distracting you from God. For it is the case that if we cannot taste mental prayer, not even, as it were, in the slightest to touch our lips, then we are dominated by our passionate emotions. Right? You're wanting to have this connection. This is the goal. This is the idea. You want to be in charge of your life instead of letting your weaknesses dominate it. So once again, we need to overcome these cardinal passions. Earlier on in section two, he addressed how we are to overcome these desires of our body, which resulted from the fall, what he called the law of sin and understood as these corrupted passions. It says, for the senses, we ordain the object and limit of their scope. This work of the law being called temperance Temperance is used to limit the gluttony of sensual desire. We lust after and crave more, but temperance, a rational factor of our will, is used to overcome gluttony and lust. Temperance helps one master their passions, just as we saw with the discussions of Aristotle, Epicurus, and Halacha. Once again, we need to value moderation temperance and you need to have wisdom to help you know what to do with that it says in the effective part of the soul we bring about the best state which bears the name love so we also need love this is the goal in like manner love is the appropriate expression of affection misplaced or misdirected affection causes evil but we can elevate those by love of our neighbor where we place their needs above our own. Our life will be more full if we are in relation with others, if we place their needs above our own. This notion of brotherly love, that you gain something, but does need some sacrifice. It is rational as well. It is moving the head to the heart. That's what's going on with that. Since we also improve the rational part by rejecting all that impedes the mind from elevating itself towards God, this part of the law we call watchfulness. Watchfulness is used to guard against temptations and to develop discernment. As mentioned earlier, we need to be watchful of our own lives. We need to know where our weaknesses are, where we should be acting, and when we should be quiet and stop. The term for what we're wanting is a state of impassibility. This is the idea of you're not letting the passions destroy your life. Another term that you could use would be being dispassionate. Although many of us have the idea of being dispassionate, of kind of just being a lazy slug and you're not going to be moved towards anything. But the aim of what we're trying to do is make our life go where we want it to go. This is what Paul Moss is advocating for. He says that impassibility does not consist in mortifying the passionate part of the soul, but in removing from evil to good, and therefore directing its energies towards these divine things. We're wanting to use the energy 
that we put into the passional nature and to producing good in our lives instead of just being there and taking it away. We don't want to destroy the idea of goodness that can come out of that. Many of you know that if you took the energy you put into bad things and you put it in the good things of your life, things would go really well. Paul Moss says, the impossible man is one who no longer possesses any evil dispositions, but is rich in good ones, who is marked by the virtues as the men of the passions are marked by evil pleasures. Right? We're wanting not to be a fool. We're not wanting to waste our time on things that aren't going to benefit us. We want to do good things in our life. We need to use the energy that we have from our passional nature and direct it towards doing good, not wasting our energy on negativity, but towards those things which will benefit you. I've heard it said in other ways, why you need to fix your slice in golf instead of just learning how to play around with it. And it slices when your ball goes too far, usually the right if you're a right-handed golfer. Why do you, is it you don't just learn how to play with it? Why do you need to fix it? Spend the hours possibly retraining yourself on how to avoid this problem? Well, it's a very simple answer. It takes away distance and ends up costing you more. Instead of driving it 220 yards, you're driving it 180. And 30, mile, 30 uh, more yards to the right. Now you're going to have to have another stroke to make up for that distance, that 50, 60, 70 yards. That's a good distance that you've just lost. If you do that twice, that's a stroke easily, two, maybe. Puts you farther away from where you're wanting to go. The same is going to be said here with the passions. Use your energy. You're swinging the club, right? Make contact, make good contact. Make it go, though, where you want it to go, not where it happens to go because of poor training, poor effort. Yeah, you've got a habit. Yeah, your, your grip is wrong or, or something else, right? But spend your energy learning how to do it right and grow from that experience. Do the same thing with all of the energy you put into the passions. Don't beat yourself up over them. Right? You're not going to mortify the passionate parts of your soul. But utilize that strength and that energy towards doing good in your life. Paul Moss continues on this theme. As to those who live in the world, right, those who are not monastics, they must force themselves to use the things of this world in conformity with the commandments of God. Will not the passionate part of the soul, as the result of this violence, be also brought to act according to the commandments? Right? This is work. This is hard. How is it you can use the energies from this passionate part if you can't just go off and become a monk, right? It says, thus one must offer to God the passionate part of the soul, alive and active, that it would be a living sacrifice. You need to offer all of these parts of your life to God, towards the greater good, if nothing else. Do you stop and recognize when your passions or bad habits take over? Are you able to pause and go, mm, I need to put this in a service of something better instead of just letting it continue to run amok? Right? And, it, and you all know too that it doesn't matter if it's just a mental or a physical bad habit. In fact, most of the passional nature you have might all just be in your mind. But you know that you need to act on it into doing good things. You need to change your mental state. You might sit there and just be judging somebody or whatever, but you know they can tell. 
you're not as smooth as you think you are, that people can't read your, your face and your body. Have you ever had a job where you hated it? You didn't say anything because, you know, it's your job and you don't want to lose your job, whatever. But what did everyone else go? Yeah, we totally know that you hate this place. You just slough off your disgust or your disdain all over the place. Right? It, it doesn't matter if it's just mental and not physical. They notice people around you. Right? So work on fixing all of this. What do we need to do? It says our eyes must acquire that gentle glance, attractive to others and conveying the mercy from on high. Have a merciful look. Be merciful towards these people, even those that you don't really like. Similarly, our ears must be attentive to the divine instructions, not only to hear them, but not becoming a forgetful hearer, right? We need to do what it says. We need to wait and listen for good opportunities for us to help in others, right? Not just wait for somebody to say something good about us, but something that we can hear and put in the service with others. Our tongues and our hand and our feet must likewise be at the service of the divine will. We need to do something that can change how we approach other people. Make sure that your body is doing something positive for other people instead of just looking out for yourself. Right? Use your senses, your mind, your attentions, your glances even in service to other people. Sacrifice your own wants and needs and desires to aid others. Palamas asks, is not such a practice of the commandments of God a common activity of the body and the soul? Once again, we're using our body and our soul together towards fulfilling these commandments, these obligations. And would they not then make your life better as a result of that? You need to sacrifice your own desires to serve others that are around you. Another technique that would be very familiar to St. Gregory is the prayer of St. Ephraim. St. Ephraim, sometimes referred to as St. Ephraim the Syrian, lived from 306 to 373. And the prayer that he wrote is being used is, is a technique in serving others. It's a change in your mind. It's one that's prayed constantly during Lent and many times is seen within Eastern Orthodoxy as the epitome of Lenten prayers. It emphasizes the rejection of the passions and the building up of the virtues because we're addressing our own faults rather than those of others. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. Remove from me these passions. But give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Give me rather humility. Give me these virtues. Help me cultivate these virtues. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother. For blessed art thou unto the ages of ages. Amen. Right? Give me the ability to see my own faults and not to be judgmental of others. Right? Again, it's very similar to the, the Jesus prayer that was said earlier of, right, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Same argument, right? Lord, grant me to see my own transgressions. Help me to see where I need work and, and not simply to judge other people. Take away the temptations of this world and help me build up virtues in its stead. Paul Moss gave us a couple of different techniques in overcoming the passions here in his discussion of, of hesychism. You should look at them and see what's going to help you more with the passions in your life. Right? Would prayer or repetitive statements concerning the good that you need to have be beneficial, be it the Jesus prayer, the prayer of St. Ephraim being utilized, or fasting, 
arresting everything for a period of time to correct those hard to overcome things. Confessions are communicating your faults to others and working with somebody else to overcome the burdens in your life. Or simply doing something positive and how you relate to others and acts of service. While these might all be sacramental, as addressed by Palamas, and indeed that's what he would advocate for, is they find their life and growth within the church. These don't have to be religious. They don't have to be sacramental. We have secular equivalents of all of these things. Yet all of them have their same basis in the fact that your brain is plastic. That you're able to do physical things to rewire your mind. And you can do activities of your mind which will help you change how you live and how you proceed. This is what Palamas is suggesting and advocating. Things that we see and we know in the world all around us, but that we need to do things to change how we see things and we need to change how we see things to change how we do things.